Yes, it's uh, time to go to our next lesson in the book of Hebrews. We will be doing our second lecture out of chapter 7. And um, I hope you'll turn in your notes to that and in your Bible <clears throat> to Hebrews chapter 7. I, I do want to tell you that we are uh, thinking about you, praying for you, and we miss you. We wish that you were here with us uh, uh, you've heard by now the uh, announcement that we are not going to be having classes on campus for the rest of the semester. So we will continue this online study <clears throat> through the end of the semester. Um, we'll be covering about a chapter a week. A uh, chapter a week average will get us to the end of the book of Hebrews uh, on time. Uh, there will be some assignments that I'll add through. Like I said, we're going to be doing a discussion. I'm going to add that today. Uh, this is um, this is Wednesday morning, and you will need to put something up, uh, post something by um, Saturday night. Normally, discussions would be earlier than that, but I'll give you till Saturday night, midnight, to post your discussion. And since there's only three of you, I want you to read the other three persons. Uh, post on Sunday and by Sunday night midnight I want you to just make some sort of a comment uh, tell them you agree with what they said and why or you disagree with what they said and why and um, so that ought to be a, a little bit more don't just say hey good job you know way to go um, try to address specifically something they say in their post your post itself should be at least 300 words and uh, I'll put up the guidelines of that, <clears throat> like I said, later today. It will be on tithing. And one thing I want to do right now is to talk a little bit about tithing. Uh, and um, but let's first have prayer and we'll do that. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for our class. I thank you for each one of these students, uh, even though they're scattered uh, long distance away, some of them. And we pray, Lord, that you would help them, keep them safe during uh, this time of crisis and concern in our country. And uh, we ask you to help us in this class. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the discussion board is about tithing, and, and it, the question is, do Christians have to tithe? <clears throat> I told you you could use my uh, words as a as a source, so you need to take notes right here. Don't have these in the notes. You're going to have to take notes. And then you can. I want you to talk to a, a pastor, your pastor, please, if you, if you can't get a hold of your pastor, at least talk to your youth pastor, but I, I would rather you talk to your pastor if you can. Um, youth pastor will be all right if you can't. And then um, at least one Bible source, a good Bible a study Bible or a Bible source or find something online or, or, or something that will help you to, um, to, to um, answer this question. Um, now, if we go back to uh, uh, the passage that we were looking at, and uh, just to remind us <clears throat> that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Melchizedek is seen as superior uh, to the priests of Aaron, the uh, line of Aaron, uh, because uh, he blessed Abraham. And uh, so uh, Jesus is being a priest after the order, order of Melchizedek is superior to Abraham, but he's also superior to the, the priestly line because the priestly line came, they were descendants of Abraham. Also, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. So um, Levi, as a descendant, would have, in essence, paid tithes to uh, Melchizedek. So Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Levi, therefore, would have paid tithes uh, to, to Melchizedek, so to speak. And, and let's start reading in verse 8 there in chapter 7. And here men that die receiveth tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom he witnessed that he liveth. So uh, the <clears throat> line that is dependent upon generation after generation receives tithes, but Melchizedek received tithes. And then um, verse 9, uh, and as I may say, so say, Levi also, who received the tithes, he, he's part of that tribe of Levi, paid tithes in Abraham. 
Um, and so uh, the, the tithes were paid in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So Levi is the descendant <clears throat> of Abraham, in essence, paid tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek. So they're, they're also superiority. Now, if we go back to chapter 14 of, of Genesis, and we look at that passage again, I'd like to, I'd like to flip back to that, uh, if you will. I'd love for you to look at it while we're doing it. If you need to pause this and open up your Bible, I'd love for you to do that. Because <clears throat> I want to show you a couple of things. Let me take a little drink here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, okay, so in verse 17, it talks about the king of Sodom coming out and blessing, uh, and then we talk, and basically the king of Salem coming out and blessing uh, Abraham, and uh, he blesses him in verse 19, so there's where the blessing comes from. And then um, in the end of verse 20, he, Abraham, gave him Melchizedek tithes of all. But notice what Melchizedek says in verse 19. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God. Notice, possessor of heaven and earth. Melchizedek calls, Abram, calls God the possessor of heaven and earth. Now, notice in verse 22, the last part of verse 22, Abraham says this, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. The possessor of heaven and earth. So, um, Abraham calls God the possessor of heaven and earth. One of the basis for the tithe, let me give you some, some, of the, some points out of this passage. Uh, the basis of the tithe is the fact that that God possesses everything. <clears throat> when we realize God possesses everything, we are giving back to God what he already possesses. We're giving back to God that which is already his. We're not taking anything from God. Uh, we're not giving even of our own gift. We're giving back that which God already owns. And so the, 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 the concept of the tithe is giving back to God that which is his and that which he, he requires. The tithe belongs to the Lord. Um, Malachi, and you can look this up, <clears throat> but put down, put down the word Malachi, which is uh, the last book of the Old Testament. Uh, Malachi, in his book, talks about the tithe. And when he talks about the tithe, tithe, he answers the question, "Will a man rob God?" And he says, "How how how do we you know how would we rob God?" The people say, and he says, you, "With your tithes and offerings, you rob God because you don't give your tithe." And so, <clears throat> it's God's, and we don't give it back to Him. And when you realize God is the possessor of everything then the tithe makes more sense that he's possessor of that. So that's one thing. Another thing about this passage in, in Genesis is that it was written hundreds of years before the law was given. Some people say Christians don't have to tithe because we don't have to follow the law. Well, tithing <clears throat> was established hundreds of years before the law was given. Yes, the law was the tithing was established in the Mosaic law. Uh, when, uh, when Moses went to Mount Sinai and got the Ten Commandments. He also got the law, and part of that has to do with tithing. You can look up some of those passages and refer to them too. Uh, what happened is there are 12 tribes of Israel. Actually, uh, Joseph uh, was split into two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, his two sons. <clears throat> so there was really 13 groups. And um, Levi was one of those groups. So the other 12 had to give a tenth to Levi. And I may have mentioned even in our last lesson it was 11, but actually I forgot Joseph was split into two, so it was 12. Those 12 give a tenth of their income to Levi. Uh, the Levites were the, high, were the priests, were the ministers of the day. They weren't given a section of land. They were given cities, <clears throat> 48 cities. 
no Jew lived anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me, no Israelite lived anymore, any any farther than ten miles from a city of Levi, a Levitical, Levitical city. And so there was a minister close by, within ten miles, and they would take them their tenth, their tithe. And that's the way they lived. They would they would do it of their gardens, of their crops. And so they lived off of that. Plus, they had enough extra to run the ministry. The priests were part of the Levites, too, part of the tribe of Levi. So running the temple and all that. Excuse me again. <clears throat> and so um, that was all part of the law. But the tithe itself was established way before the law. The principle of the tithe is established way before the law, way back here in the book of Genesis. So I hope you've jotted that down and you can use that as part of your notes uh, as we are approaching this uh, and, you, and, and as we are, um, as you are approaching this discussion board. And I hope that will be a help uh, to you. Um, I would also look up uh, a spot where Jesus spoke at the time. He said, this is all you two have done and not let the other undone. You can look that up in, when Jesus speaking. So it was a New Testament concept that Jesus said, this you, all, you have done. And uh, so you can, you can consider that too. So think, of, think about this. Think it through. Ask your pastor. Uh, look, try to find at least one other source to help you. And then write down and within about 300 words or so, what you feel like um, the tithe, the answer to the question, must a Christian, do, does a Christian have to tithe? All right, let's continue on. <clears throat> we um, finished up uh, in verse 10 of chapter 7, and we're going to continue on from there. And as we're continuing on from there, we see that um, we go to verse 11. Um now, again, what he's, has he done? He has established that Melchizedek is better. Verse 7, the, ble the less is blessed of the better. Melchizedek was better than Abraham. Therefore, and Melchizedek is better than Levi. Therefore, Melchizedek is better than Aaron. <clears throat> the Aaronic priesthood, or what's called the Levitical priesthood. It, there's a problem with the Levitical priesthood. Look at verse 11. If, therefore, perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So why in the world would God bring up Jesus Christ through the tribe of Judah and say that you are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek out of Psalm 110. Why would God do that if the Levitical priesthood, the priesthood of Aaron, was perfect? This is a rhetorical question, <clears throat> which basically uh, is that well, there would have been no need if it was perfect. Therefore, the conclusion is it was not perfect. Uh, it was not perfect. So we look at our next slide and we see the imperfection of the Levitical priesthood. If there were, if 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 it were perfect, if the Levitical priesthood, the priesthood of Aaron would have been would have been perfect. There would have been no need for another priesthood. Now let's look at the next logical conclusion, verse twelve. For the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity of a change also of the law. Look at the logic there. If the priest is not perfect, then there's a problem with the law. The law has to be changed. The law has to be changed. Now he's shifting from the discussion about the priesthood <clears throat> to the law. And uh, he is going to spend a great amount of time dealing in the next three to four chapters uh, especially through chapter 9. And I'm flipping through to, re to remind myself all the way into chapter 10. 
So from now, all from middle of chapter 7 all the way to about the middle of chapter 10, we're going to be talking about the law. This is really at the center of the whole thing. Uh, do they follow the law or do they follow Christ? Do they go back to the old law or do they follow Christ? And it really helps us to understand why we don't follow the law today. So this information is going to be extremely valuable as we move forward from here. So, again, verse 12. <clears throat> For the priesthood being changed, there's made a necessity, uh, a, uh, a change also of the law. Now, if you look at the slide, um, let's see what this has to say. Paul makes arguments of the need of a change of the law in a number of places. Uh, let me flip back to Romans uh, chapter 7. If I flip back to Romans chapter 7 and we take a look at that for a moment, I'd love for you to pause and find that in your Bible, if you will. Please have your Bibles ready and, and looking through them and going through this with me. It's so important. Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Uh, we find out that know ye brethren, know ye not brethren, for I speak unto them that know the law. He's talking to the Jews. How that a law... The law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound to the law as long as her husband, uh, as long as he liveth. But if a husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her own husband. He gives an illustration about how this works with marriage. As long as you're married, you're bound to your spouse. But if the pa spouse passes away, that's no longer the case. Uh, you take Dr. Randy Cox who has taught for us a number of years. He was the pastor of Beacon, great man of God. His dear wife, Miss Jo, passed away. Very sad about that. It was a very sad time around. Uh, and then once that happened, though, he was free to marry somebody else without any repercussions, any problems in regards to um, the marriage covenant uh, that he had made to Miss Jo and to God. There was no concern about that whatsoever. He was free to marry somebody else. And the same way with a woman, Miss, Miss uh, Joanne, uh, who he married, um, when her husband passed away quite a few years ago, he was also a tr great man. She was free to marry somebody else. So in the same way, he's saying, now, now verse 3, so then if if while her husband liveth, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit to death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we were, should serve in newness of spirit and not oldness of the letter. What shall I say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, had I known, not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. And so I kind of read it farther, but I'm glad I, I said that. The law does have its purpose. The law helps us to know what sin is. That's one of the reasons for the law. But when we died and were wrote in, 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 to our past life and were made alive anew through regeneration, through being born again, our relationship with the law was severed. And now we're now we can marry Christ. See that? See how that analogy is? And so, the law changed in our relationship to it. Second um, Corinthians chapter three. If we go to that uh, passage and look in verse uh, seven, we see some of the same ideas. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of the, of the countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of spirit be rather, glory, rather glorious? For the ministration 
of condemnation be glorious, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that, that excelleth. For, it, for if that which is done away, that which is done away is glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. So what is he talking about here? He's talking about the engraving in the stones in verse 7. What was engraved in the stones? The law of God. So this is the same idea of having a, uh, an ability to be uh, freed from that. Galatians is probably the best book, though, to look at, to really understand uh, the difference and the breaking away from the law. It is such a, uh, a, a wonderful book, and we don't have time to, to study it parallel, but we can read uh, this passage here in Galatians chapter 3. And so let's just read that real quickly, and starting in verse uh, 19. And so Galatians 3, 19, Wherefore then serveth the law? What's the reason for the law? It was added because of transgression, because of sin till the seed, as Jesus, should come, to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For there, uh, for if there had been given a law, uh, been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness would have been by the law. See, it tells us what the law is. We found out what the law is in Romans, that it's, it's to show us sin, uh, so, to show us what sin is. Um, the law had some great reasons to be there. Uh, it's not against the promises of God. But it says, if the law could have given life, <laughs> then righteousness could have come by the law. The law could not give life. It was impossible for the law to give us life. Uh, verse 22, but the scripture saith, excuse me, the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster, our child leader, to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster or a child leader. God saw the Israelites almost like children. They, they were able to uh, see um, only so much. They were able to understand only so much. Um, their knowledge was limited. And so God had to treat them like you treat a child. Let me give you an illustration I've given many times that I hope will be a helpful in this. Um, and once I give this illustration, we're going to finish this lecture, and then I'm going to finish the chapter in a, in a third lecture, kind of break this up a little bit. Um, when my children were little, uh, we lived in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I actually bought a lot and built a house not too many blocks away from our church. <clears throat> uh, it was in a housing development and so there wasn't uh, you wouldn't think there would be a lot of traffic back in that housing development but the problem was we lived on a corner and people could come off of one road Newtown Road it was called and cut through our housing development turn the corner at our house and go down to Virginia Beach Boulevard some people would do that to avoid the intersection so our little corner had quite a bit of traffic. It wasn't very fast traffic. It was a very, it was a housing development, but there was traffic. My children were small. Our twins, who are now 35, uh, were uh, born while we were there. They were born when we moved into that house. They were too young to even be out in the front yard, but sometimes, uh, unless we were there holding their hand, <laughs> But sometimes I might be working on my car or sitting on the porch or doing some work around the front yard, and we would let our older children work in the, play in the front yard. Um, and uh, they were, you know, pre-elementary or young elementary, you know, 
like in the age range of four, five, six, maybe seven, that, that age range. So let's say, you know, we had two older children that are 15 months apart. Let's say that they were five and six or, or four, and, four and six years old. And we had a rule for them. They could play in the front yard, but the rule was don't go past the ditch. That was the rule. Don't go past the ditch. And all they had to understand was don't go past the ditch. It was, I guess you could say, a law we had, an absolute law. If they disobeyed that law, they got punished swiftly and severely. In fact, if I saw them starting to disobey the law, they got a sharp rebuke. Josh, come back here. The ball, he, he, he drops the ball or kicks the ball, throws it to his sister, and she misses it, goes out in the yard. I mean, out in the street. Josh, don't you dare go out in that street. So even we would even be harsh to them, even getting close to breaking the law. But we would, be, we would punish them if they broke that law. Why? There were cars coming down that street, and they could get killed. They didn't have to understand physics. They didn't have to understand biology. They didn't even have to totally comprehend the danger. All they had to do is obey the law. That was the most important thing happening to them at that moment, to obey that law. Does that make sense? Okay. A few years later, we were we had moved down here. We lived in Garner for a while, and then we finally moved to Goldsboro. Uh, now our our children are uh, are teenagers, junior high and teenagers. Um, the youngest are like seventh grade. The oldest ones are high school, maybe even college. Uh, we lived on a road, which the traffic on that road went much faster than the traffic on our previous road. Uh, the previous road was Larry Avenue, Virginia Beach. This road was um, River Bend Road in, in uh, Rosewood, outside of Goldsboro. And, it, and the traffic went much faster on that road. We had a ditch, very similar, uh, right before you get to the road, a little drainage ditch. But we no longer had that rule. We didn't have a rule, don't go past the ditch. When they were five and six, we had a very hard, harsh rule. In fact, we were so harsh on, uh, so steadfast on that that if they got close to the ditch, we would be very, uh, be a very sharp rebuke. But we had no such rule. We let them go past the ditch any time they wanted to. In fact, I would tell them to go get the mail, which was on the other side of the street. Sometimes, I'd even let the older ones take a vehicle and go out into that road. Wow. What's, what was the difference? It was even a more dangerous place. What was the difference? Their age. We no longer treated them like children. Uh, they, had a, they, they could understand. They were old enough to understand there's danger when cars are coming down the road. Now, we might say, be careful. We might say, watch, look both ways before you cross. You do that as you're training children to cross roads you tell them that over and over again look both ways look both, both ways look right look left look right at you and go you know or whatever which court uh, i guess it's look left look right then look left again you, you you do that kind of a thing you just double check double check double check go um see the difference the law earlier was to, was a schoolmaster to lead them to what needed to happen later it was a child leader and the Old Testament law was that way. God was training the, the Hebrew children. He was training them to eventually follow the principles of the Word of God. And so the very specific laws that were given, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do that, helped them understand the principles of what they would do later. Later they were freed from that law. And some of them they didn't even have to follow. Certainly the sacrificial laws, Jesus fulfilled all of those, but even like the laws of eating, no longer have to follow that. Uh, Paul, I mean, excuse me, God made that very clear with Peter in the book of Acts. And so this is the situation here in Galatians. Notice on our slide, uh, Christ came from the tribe of Judah, could not have served without such a change. That's one thing that happened. There had to be a change before Christ could even serve. 
as a as as the new priest. Um, and so let's read. Uh, we. Um, I'm just thinking about here. I'm thinking out loud a second. Excuse me as I think out loud. Um, I tell you what, we will get into that that particular point later. I'm going to stop there after my illustration. I said it would give us all a break. I'll be one more lecture uh, this week to finish out Chapter 7. But I hope this illustration has helped you see the importance of the need of the law to change and why it had to change and what it meant for it to change from these passages. And I hope you've taken notes and you're ready uh, to move on to the, to the rest of the chapter. We'll be in that in the next lecture. God bless you.